The film begins with a man plummeting into a room. In a rush, this man tries to solve a puzzle in the room. He panics as the room increasingly constricts around him. To save his own life, he must struggle to solve the puzzle. However, failing to succeed, the man is eventually crushed by the walls, marking the beginning of the movie. Three days prior to the incident, Zoe, a college student studying quantum physics in Chicago, hesitates when answering her professor's question. After class, Zoe receives advice from her professor to be more proactive, and somewhat cryptically he suggests, try doing something that scares you. Moving on to the second individual, a stock trader named Jason. From the beginning until now, Jason has been engrossed in calls with his clients. The third person is Ben. Seeing his boss, he quickly offers himself for an open cashier position, but his boss rejects him, deeming Ben inexperienced in customer service. Back to Jason, who is presented with a mysterious box. Zoe, uncomfortable with such parties, prefers to stay in her room discussing quantum physics. When her friend leaves, Zoe experiences a bizarre hallucination. Suddenly it's morning, and as her friend is about to leave for home, they discover a package from the professor for Zoe at the door. The contents of the package are identical to what Jason received. Ben, just back at the office, receives a similar box from his boss. Now, all three are curious, but in different ways. Zoe examines the box in detail, Ben uses a more brute force approach, and Jason resorts to watching tutorials. Eventually, they all open their boxes to find a paper inside, stating that if they can escape from the challenging escape rooms, they stand to win $10,000. Tired of being broke, Ben heads straight to the Minos building the next day. Then a beautiful woman named Amanda arrives. She approaches the reception. To participate, there's no fee, but ID is required and phones are not allowed. As she's about to enter, the receptionist ominously states, Thank you for your service. Not wanting to be alone, the elevator door is blocked by a young man named Danny, who, it turns out, has two phones. They then arrive at a room and meet Mike, and also Jason. Amanda, who knocks on the glass, receives a lackluster response from the guard. Suddenly, they gather like a family, introducing themselves to one another. Mike mentions he once had a dog named Amanda, with heterochromic eyes, but it has since passed away. And then Ben arrives. While passing time, Amanda accidentally reads a headline stating five people were burnt alive, a foreboding sign. Additionally, Danny shares his extensive experience participating in such challenges, even listing them off. Bored Ben, craving another smoke, tries to exit but the door handle comes off. He's perplexed. Inside the door handle's hole there was a button resembling an oven dial. Immediately, Danny thought the game had started. Everyone began searching for items that could serve as clues to solve the game. While rummaging through, Amanda noticed all magazine subscriptions were addressed to one Dr. Wooten Yu. Then Mike found a screwdriver inside a book titled Fahrenheit 451. Zoe saw the book and decided to tinker with the oven dial. After tinkering, the room unexpectedly began to heat up. Amanda, in a panic, sought advice from Danny who had played similar games before. Danny suggested that normally one could ask for hints. When Amanda asked for a hint, the admin replied, Please have a seat. Someone will be with you shortly. Zoe began to suspect something was amiss, noting the person's peculiar phrasing. Jason was startled to find a snow globe containing a ship. He then accidentally noticed a keyhole in the window of the admin room. Danny thought the next clue must be there, so they all hurried to find the key. Instead of searching for the key for too long, Ben tried to break the window with a fire extinguisher, but the extinguisher was plastic, so Ben simply discarded it. Suddenly, the room's columns also began to heat up. Because of that, Zoe decided to inspect the extinguisher, found the key, and when the key was turned, they were shocked to find that the voice they had been hearing was just a statue. The phone rang. The call merely advised all participants to follow the game's rules, and as the call ended, the windows also closed, and the room grew hotter. Panic ensued among everyone. Zoe took the initiative to get a glass of water for Amanda. While delivering it, Zoe accidentally saw the burn scars on Amanda's back. While others panicked, the composed Zoe found a clue. It turned out that the coasters on the table were the key to the clue. All participants helped, and the ventilation opened. Jason was the first to find an exit, but needing a screwdriver, 
Mike followed Jason. Soon after, Jason and Mike made it to the next room. Then Amanda followed them. Suddenly, Zoe had the idea to place a glass of water on each coaster. Then, Amanda's trauma resurfaced. Zoe had no choice but to help Amanda. The room became so hot that the mannequin was scorched. Together, they filled glasses with water. Unfortunately, the water for the last glass ran out because Amanda had drunk it. The debate wasn't even over. Suddenly, flames appeared from above. Luckily, Ben still had alcohol in his pocket. They both escaped through the ventilation just before being engulfed by the flames. Up to this point, Danny still thought all these events were just part of the game. Meanwhile, his companions were beyond terrified. They wanted to call the police, but had no signal. In the second room, they had to open two padlocks. Jason tried in a bag and found the first key and succeeded. The second padlock required a password. Everyone began looking for clues. Mike found a clue that read, you'll go down in history. Jason tried entering names of presidents with seven letters, but none worked. Ben, idly looking around, accidentally noticed a deer antler with nine letters. Recalling his mischievous past, Ben remembered a song they used to sing that had the words, you'll go down in history. And soon after, Ben spoke up, Rudolph, prompting Jason to try. And successfully, the second lock was opened. Everyone rushed out of the room, only for the door to close and lock behind them automatically. Danny, wandering off, suddenly bumped into a wall. Unexpectedly, a vent opened, releasing cold air. They gathered around and found all the windows sealed shut. They continued their search for clues, and Zoe discovered some writing. Mike, noticing a statue of a dog, turned and found a fishing rod. Jason returning was startled by a red coat found by Amanda. Then they took turns wearing the coat. Ben accidentally stumbled upon a fishing hole. Mike then proudly arrived with his fishing gear. Zoe accidentally found a compass in the coat pocket. She then went off and found a bear statue. Combining the first clue, Zoe eventually found a magnet. Amanda, disliking the smell of smoke, made Ben stay away. Zoe, returning, had the idea to combine the magnet with the fishing rod. Soon after, the group managed to fish out a block of ice containing a key. Since the ice was solid and hard, they wanted to borrow Ben's lighter. But he was sulking, so that was that. Danny eventually went to fetch it, but suddenly he fell. Everyone panicked, searching for Danny but to no avail, and Danny met his end. Ben, feeling accused by the inquiries, was even suspected of orchestrating the game. Ben, of course, denied it, saying he was just a store clerk. Then Amanda revealed her scars came from the Iraq War. Rather than engaging in pointless debates, Jason was eager to melt the ice block. Concerned that hypothermia might confuse and distract them, they all joined hands to transfer body heat to the ice block, and after some time, the ice began to melt, but the others were already weary. Only Mike managed to endure the cold. Jason then suspected that these events resembled a past experience he had. Finally, Mike succeeded, but Jason, now confused, snatched the key and began searching for the exit. Reaching the end, the door wouldn't open. It turned out the exit was across the way. They reached the third room. Suddenly, the room experienced a minor earthquake and a phone rang up high. It fell. Jason accidentally discovered a clue that the door had no handle. Mike, looking around, realized the number eight billiard ball was missing. Suddenly the phone rang, and Ben managed to save Mike, realizing the floor was collapsing. Immediately, everyone stood at the edges. Amanda quickly climbed up and saw a small safe. Mike suggested trying the combination one, two, three, four. Zoe, seeing a giant puzzle, went off to try with Mike's help and Jason, who was just loitering, nearly fell. Shortly after, Zoe managed to crack her code, which was 9,810, but it turned out to be incorrect. In an effort to reduce the weight, Zoe attempted to move but ended up falling, leading to a flashback. Upon waking, Zoe immediately suggested reversing the numbers to 0189, and voila, but suddenly the phone rang again, and once more, Jason nearly fell. Amanda immediately attempted to climb, but because the ball fell, Amanda had no choice but to jump. And suddenly, just before Amanda fell, she threw the ball. Jason just left, and they found themselves in the fourth room. Jason immediately sought help from Zoe, who was in mourning. 
Suddenly the lights came on, and the room's design was identical to each participant's personal room. In each room there were documents for every participant. It turned out that each of them had previously survived extraordinary accidents and were the sole survivors. Starting with Amanda, who survived a bomb in Iraq, Zoe, who survived a plane crash, Jason, who was stranded at sea, Ben, who was drunk and crashed his car while singing, and lastly Mike, who was trapped in mine ruins. Jason shared that his ship had capsized in a storm. His friend suffered from hypothermia, suddenly became aggressive, and attacked Jason, then went off on his own. Jason was bewildered. How did the game creators know their traumatic memories? And Zoe, examining Danny's file, mentioned he had once been poisoned by carbon monoxide. It was then revealed that Dr. Wooten Yu, the game's creator, wanted to test their luck as survivors once again. Who was the luckiest among them? And they were all challenged to face extreme accident conditions they had each previously experienced. Suddenly the TV turned on and a countdown began. After a brief debate, Ben made Zoe realize they had been under surveillance all along. While the others were busy looking for clues, Zoe focused on destroying the cameras to win. Then, thanks to Ben's dead cousin, who understood sign language, they pieced together the clue, which was EKG. Jason accidentally found a carbon monoxide cylinder. Then Jason brought over an EKG machine and tried it on Ben. His heartbeat was faint. So they switched the EKG to Mike, and it was still faint. Jason wanted to use a defibrillator on Mike. Initially, Mike refused, but after some coaxing, he agreed. And eventually, Mike died instantly. Watching the TV in the last moments, Jason realized the EKG was looking for the faintest heartbeat, and suddenly carbon gas was hastily released. But they can still survive. Cruelly, Jason left followed by Ben, leaving Zoe still busy destroying cameras, ultimately defeated. So it was down to Ben and Jason in the fourth room. With all friends gone and Jason showing no empathy at all, Ben was convinced that Jason has killed his friend to survive. Rather than dying foolishly, they both decided to try the fifth room. They managed to open the hatch, but suddenly they felt dizzy. Then the next clue was on the hatch door. The clue, perplexing those already dizzy, instructed them to find the antidote. And Ben found it first, but Jason tried to snatch it. Ben's leg was broken, but Ben unleashed his ultimate move, causing Jason to hit his head and die instantly. Ben succeeded in the fourth challenge, bringing us back to the opening scene, where a man falls into a room, which turns out to be Ben. In the final challenge, Ben needed to solve a puzzle on the door. Meanwhile, Zoe, who was presumed dead, surprises two individuals in hazmat suits from behind. Armed with a pistol, Zoe makes her escape. Ben, struggling and pressed, manages to crawl to a fireplace and against all odds, survives. Upon exiting, Ben finally meets Dr. Wooten Yu. While they're conversing, Zoe also manages to escape from her room. He reveals that last year, the participants of the escape room were college athletes. Understandably, Ben calls him a crazed psychopath. But then he's unexpectedly offered a cigarette. But suddenly he tries to kill Ben. The system changes abruptly, and the old man is forced to play against Zoe. Fortunately, Zoe manages to save Ben. Zoe, nearly defeated, is saved in return by Ben. And finally, Ben killed the old man. They then escaped from the Minos building, and Ben ends up in hospital care. Soon, the police arrive to take Zoe to the Minos building, but the first room is just a chaotic, shapeless mess, leading the police to disbelief. The film skips to six months later. Zoe reunites with Ben, who's no longer inexperienced. Zoe brings up how the deaths of their friends were reported, including Mike, who had a heart attack in a bathroom, Jason, who fell off a motorcycle, Danny, who drowned in a lake, and Amanda, who fell from a cliff. So who exactly is behind this game? Then Zoe realizes that the Minos logo is actually coordinates to an industrial building in Manhattan. In two weeks, they plan to fly there. The scene shifts to a crashing plane. A flight attendant finds a clue and tries to solve the next puzzle. But in the end, it turns out to be just a simulation, leaving the mystery of who else is running this game. The movie ends. If you like this video, don't forget to subscribe. Because by subscribing, you have supported me to make better videos. See you in the next video. Two.